you all seem to really enjoy my last Dark Things I Found on the Internet video from a few months back. Since then, I've been prowling the shadowy crevices of the web in search of new horrors to tell you about, and I'm happy to report that I've found quite a few rotten nuggets hiding in the darkness. Who knows, we may just have a new series on our hands here. In today's mishmash of entries, we'll be exploring a twisted Japanese reality show, a hacker with a chilling offline identity, and a text-to-speech program that just may have you looking over your shoulder and questioning its purpose. But before we get into all of that, today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, the first game to bring a true console level experience to your phone. With hundreds of artifacts to equip and over 600 champions blessed with unique skills, you can build and develop your team the way you want. When it comes to fantasy settings, I've always been drawn to monstrous creatures, and luckily for me, Raid is absolutely filled to the brim with them. For Scare Factor, these would have to be my top three factions Demon Spawn who not only look devilishly cool, but help you hell-raise the stakes with plenty of literal firepower. The Undead Horde, because zombies, vampires, and pumpkin-headed harvesters will never not be awesome. And of course, the Skimwalker faction, who deal beastly damage and have some fun skills to play with. And this month, Raid's got a non-stop schedule of special events and activities, including Forge Pass Season 3, with some amazing rewards on offer, including a limited edition artifact set. If that's not enough, Raid's bringing out some new champions, along with some awesome looking champion skins for the incredible Madame Ceres. But wait, here's the big news. Raid just released a super-powered legendary version of everybody's favourite champion, Death Knight. The best part is, everyone can get him for free. All you have to do is log in and play Raid for 7 days between now and October 27th, and you'll add Ultimate Death Knight to your collection. You can also use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free items to instantly level up your new strongest champion all the way to level 50, 5 star ascension. Right now's the best time to get started in Raid, and if you click the link in my description or scan my QR code here on screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Tyrell, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon champions as soon as you get in game. All that treasure's waiting for you inside. Thank you so much Raid for sponsoring today's video. Tomoaki Hamatsu is a Japanese comedian and television personality, most famous for his appearance on the game show Susanoo Denpa Shonen, which aired on Nippon Television between 1998 and 2002. Tomoaki featured on the show for just over one of those years but that would turn out to be the most infamous 15 months in the program's history. This is the story of Japan's darkest livestream. The Torment of Tomoaki Hamatsu I probably don't need to tell you that Japan's no stranger to intense game shows. One program that comes to mind is Zagamen, which features in the Guinness Book of World Records and holds the prestigious title of Most Extreme Game Show. On Zagamen, contestants put themselves through some truly horrifying experiences, such as being buried up to their necks, tied up and dangled in front of angry bulls, and much worse if you can believe it. Other countries tried to copy the format, though for legal reasons couldn't quite match the same level of extremity as Japan. For the most part, these high-octane game shows have become relics of the past, and even during their heyday, they mostly focused on physical torment that lasted a few hours at most. Tomoaki Hamatsu's segment on Denpa Shonen, however, was much different. In 1998, Susanoo Denpa Shonen held a raffle to find the subject of their next TV special. The project itself was being kept top secret, so the contestants applying to be on the show, whom were all unknown and aspiring comedians, didn't really know what they were getting themselves into. For Tomoaki Hamatsu, it didn't really matter. The young man had big dreams of becoming a famous funny man, and was eager to make a name for himself. If he could get on a popular game show like Denpa Shonen, that could be his big break. But little did he know that Susanoo Denpa Shonen were about to take their show in a completely different direction. Upon winning the raffle, Tomoaki was led by the production team to an extremely small apartment in an undisclosed location. Inside, he was immediately instructed to remove all of his clothes. If he refused, the raffle would be held again, 
and Tomoaki would lose this huge opportunity to be on TV. With his future career at stake, Tomoaki reluctantly agreed, and, in front of the camera, got out of his clothes and into his birthday suit. An aubergine, or eggplant emoji, was used by the editors to conceal his manhood. From then on, Tomoaki was referred to as Nasubi, the Japanese word for aubergine. That wasn't just because of the emoji, but also because the producers thought his head resembled the shape of the fruit. Tomoaki wasn't only deprived of his clothes, but of pretty much everything. He began the show with no possessions, no food, no furniture, and no sources of entertainment. All he was given was water and a stack of mail-in magazine sweepstakes. He was told that if he wanted food or other items, he'd have to win them by filling out the raffle cards and sending them off. If he didn't win any food, he couldn't eat. If he didn't win any clothes, he'd stay cold. And, most importantly, he wasn't allowed to leave the apartment. The production team would mail his sweepstakes for him. In order to earn his release from the apartment, he'd have to win at least 1 million yen, approximately $10,000, in magazine sweepstake prizes. And so, Tomoaki got mailing. He had a whole mountain of sweepstakes to work with, and absolutely nothing else to do. He began the show with a lot of enthusiasm. After all, how long could it take to earn 10 grand in prizes? A couple of months of solid mailing at most, right? Not quite. As the show went on, Tomoaki slowly accumulated prizes from his sweepstakes successes. As you can imagine, these were mostly small things, and rarely items that he could actually put to good use. Due to the sporadic nature of his wins, he often lacked essentials, like food to eat, and during one particularly difficult three-month period, actually resorted to eating dog food which he had won in order to ease his hunger. In another instance, he actually ended up winning a 5kg sack of rice, and was visibly elated that he could finally eat something filling. Only then did he realise that he didn't have a rice cooker or any pots, and in order to make the rice, he'd need to win one of those too. There was also a point where a food delivery driver came to Tomoaki's door with some takeout ramen, only to say that he had knocked on the wrong door. This was likely a setup by the producers in order to get a reaction out of Tomoaki and give the audience a good laugh. But Tomoaki certainly wasn't laughing. As well as being hungry for most of the show's run, Tomoaki rarely got to interact with other human beings. Occasionally a mailman would come to the door to deliver his prizes, or a doctor might show up unannounced to give him a checkup. But for the most part, he spent his days in complete isolation. Despite being nothing more than televised cruelty, Tomoaki's ordeal on Denpa Shonen attracted a huge crowd. The show averaged around 17 million viewers every Sunday night. To quote Moist Critical, who recently covered this show in one of his uploads, that's more viewers than the last four years of the NBA Finals and the World Series. Needless to say, the torment of Tomoaki was tapping into the public sense of morbid curiosity. Those juicy viewing figures convinced the producers to up the ante. Instead of airing Tomoaki's segment once per week, they began live-streaming the entirety of his time in the apartment online. The whole time that he was in the apartment, Tomoaki was never told that he was being live-streamed, and instead believed that only a highlight reel of his experience would be shown on TV. So, in between all of the moments of Tomoaki putting on a brave face and trying his best to be entertaining for the camera, viewers of the stream could watch as he genuinely suffered in solitary confinement. It was clear that his sanity was beginning to be affected by the experience too, as he played and talked with a stuffed seal which he had won as if it were real. Since he had no other human or animal contact, the toy became his only social outlet and friend. Although Tomoaki's time in isolation was entirely real, I and many others are convinced that the show's producers were actually choosing which items to give him and which to hold back. Though Tomoaki was truly living this nightmare, it was in all likelihood executives deciding that the first clothes he won should be a pair of used knickers, or that he should win a TV with no antenna, or a PlayStation game with no console to play it on. 
If Tomoaki actually won something that would make his life much easier, it would have been extremely easy for the people behind the scenes to simply not have it delivered. All the while, viewers lapped up Tomoaki's mental decline, and laughed as he resorted to things like consuming raw pork. For the duration of the show's run, Tomoaki had no clothes, scarcely any nutritious food, barely any social interaction, no sunlight, no contact with his friends and family. He couldn't cut his hair and nails, could only brush his teeth whenever he had some toothpaste, and could only use toilet paper on the rare occasions he had some in stock. After 335 days of living this inhuman existence, Tomoaki finally won enough prizes to take him over the million yen threshold and complete the Denpa Shonen Challenge. To let Tomoaki know, the producers snuck into his room in the middle of the night and set off party poppers in his face. They handed him back his clothes and escorted him out of his prison. In celebration of his success, the producers flew Tomoaki out to South Korea and took him to a theme park. He was of course visibly ecstatic. This was the first time he'd felt sun on his face in 11 months. The first time he'd been out in public with other people. The first time he got to enjoy a real meal. At last, Tomoaki's nightmare was finally over. And then, the producers asked him to put on a blindfold, and did this. So They made him do it all over again, in South Korea. This time, his goal was to earn enough money in prizes to afford a first-class ticket back to Japan. This went on for six more months. After 15 months total, the producers finally decided that Tomoaki had earned them enough money and that he was free to go, but not before one final humiliation. They moved him to what he thought was a new apartment only to reveal that he was actually in front of a live studio audience. After the show finished, and Tomoaki was released back into the real world, he was eager to make a big splash as a comedian. After all, he'd only ever agreed to be on the show to get his big break. Surely the horrific 15 months he had just spent being tormented for the public's entertainment had earned him the respect of audiences, networks, and talent agents like the producers of the show had promised him. In his mind, the gigs were about to come rolling in. But, unfortunately, since Tomoaki had spent his time in the apartment disconnected from the outside world, he didn't realise that the rest of Japan didn't want to laugh along with him. They were only interested in laughing at him. In the years that followed his appearance on Denpa Shonen, Tomoaki failed to secure much work as a comedian, and struggled to make a career out of his passion. He appeared on a few panel shows on local networks, but spent most of his time working as a dramatic actor in stage plays. As one can imagine, a year spent in isolation can take a heavy toll on one's mental state. Tomoaki suffered with PTSD for quite some time after the show ended, he also became much more reserved, found that he struggled in social situations, and couldn't hold conversations for much time at all. This of course severely affected his ability to perform comedy. His physical health had also declined due to a lack of nutrition and proper exercise. Thankfully, he seems to be doing much better these days, having founded a stage group called Eggplant Way that tours around Japan putting on performances. He also put his strength of will to the test once again in 2016, when he successfully scaled Mount Everest. Speaking of his experience on Denpa Shonen, Tomoaki said that he was grateful for the opportunity to be on TV, and for the things that he had learned from appearing on the program. The show's lead producer, Toshio Tsuchiya, later apologised to Tomoaki for putting him through 15 months of hell, but said that he didn't have any regrets about doing so. 
My only goal is to produce miracles on film, he said. And with Tomoaki Hamatsu, that is what happened. And that's the story of Tomoaki Hamatsu, aka Nasubi, the man who sacrificed 15 months of his life, spent it in solitary confinement, and was tormented on the daily, only to be cast aside upon his release. All for the viewing pleasure of Nippon TV's audience. The fact that a cruel show like this could ever air is crazy in itself. But even crazier is just how many people tuned in to watch Tomoaki suffer and laughed as he did. Hack Forums is a website that describes itself as the ultimate security technology and social media forum. The platform, which has been around for decades now, is a place for self-professed hackers to connect and chat about mainframes, or whatever it is that hackers like to talk about. The forum has been the recipient of a lot of criticism over the years, with critics saying that the site enables and encourages online criminal activity. Those same critics point to people like Zachary Shames, a man who was arrested for selling keylogging software on the site, which allowed other users to steal personal information. Back in July of 2009, a new account was registered on hack forums, that of user Nokia2 on 2. Within a short period of time, he became something of a site-wide celebrity, mainly because, whoever this guy was, he had plenty of cash to throw around. He made large donations to the site, did huge giveaways, and procured the services of many of the site's members, paying them to do online jobs for him, or giving them money to exchange for bitcoins. He endeared himself to the other members too, by donating funds to those with interesting and charitable ideas. Before long, Nokia 2 Mon 2 was arguably the most respected user on the close-knit forum. Where others bickered and argued with one another, everyone seemed to agree that Nokia was one of the good guys. Having gained the community's trust, it became easy for him to purchase things from the typically aloof user base. Obviously on these kind of online platforms, where people are often acting outside the law, most users are wary of who they do business with, but pretty much everyone was willing to sell to Nokia. Between the years of 2009 and 2016, Nokia 2 Mon 2 made more than 500 posts on the site, most of which revolved around him buying the services of other hackers, and the details of the hacking activity he had commissioned, the platforms he had targeted and taken down, the social media accounts and videos he had deleted, the passwords to email accounts he had acquired, the manufactured engagement he had created on Twitter, YouTube and Facebook, things of that nature. This had all cost him thousands upon thousands of dollars, so it was clear to everyone on the forum that Nokia was a man of means. But where was all this money coming from, and who exactly was Nokia 2 Mon 2? Well, occasionally the online man of mystery would have a bit too much to drink, and would take to the forum to discuss his political views, and even once let slip that he was from Saudi Arabia. This got people theorising about his identity. While some thought he was just a millionaire who disliked certain groups of people, others believed that he may have some stronger political ties. Most people didn't seem to mind who he was or where he got his money from though. He was just that popular guy that did loads of giveaways and gave plenty of other users jobs. And that generosity continued for years. That is, until one day in 2016, when, without telling a soul why, Nokia 2 Mon 2 disappeared from the site completely. It's unknown why exactly the man behind the account suddenly stopped visiting the site, but in the minds of many, it's because he feared accidentally revealing his true identity. But little did Nokia 2 Mon 2 realise, he already had. Despite being an active member on Hack Forum, Nokia 2 Mon 2 wasn't exactly a tech whiz. As it would turn out, he'd actually registered a number of websites under his real name in order to host botnets. Using the website who.is, several curious web sleuths were able to uncover his personal information, including his contact info, real name, and his social media accounts. One of these sites had metadata that linked him to the Nokia 2 Mon 2 account on Hack Forum. And so it was learned that Nokia 2 Mon 2 the prince of Hack Forum, did indeed have some royal links of his own. 
Nokia 212's real name was Saud al Qatani, a Saudi Arabian consultant and, at the time, royal court advisor to King Abdullah and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Not only that, Saud al Qatani was the head of the Saudi Rapid Intervention Force, a group whose role was to keep Saudi citizens in check and protect the integrity of the kingdom. Their modus operandi was simple. If someone was causing a lot of trouble, the SRAF would lure them to a luxury hotel, hold them captive, interrogate them, and force them to give up all of their assets or face the consequences. Those consequences involved electrocution, flogging, and lifelong imprisonment. Saud personally oversaw a large number of those operations. He was also present during the horrific torment of Lejeune al Hathrul, a women's rights activist who, unbelievably, thought females should be able to drive cars and shouldn't require male guardians. For three years, she and numerous other members of her group were beaten, shocked, mock drowned, forced to pleasure their guards, and were threatened daily with death. Saud himself had threatened to slaughter one of these activists and told them that he would dump their body into the sewers. As you can tell, Saud wasn't as kind-hearted as his online persona had many believing. Arguably the worst thing that Saud did occurred in 2018. On October 2nd of that year, a journalist for the Washington Post named Jamal Khashoggi went to the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul to obtain marriage documents. Jamal had previously been very close to the Saudi royal family, but after questioning their views on certain subjects, was forced to flee to the USA. In America, he began writing articles about the dark side of his motherland. Saud had been in contact with Jamal since 2017. The outspoken Jamal considered Saud a person he could trust, a friend even. It's unclear whether Jamal had willingly told Saud that he would be going to the consulate that fateful day, or whether Saud had been using spyware to keep an eye on Jamal's phone activity. But suffice it to say, he knew that he would be there. Surveillance cameras caught images of Jamal Khashoggi entering the consulate. But strangely, they didn't capture any footage of him leaving the building. With no trace of the man anywhere, his concerned family contacted the authorities in Istanbul, and Jamal was declared a missing person. It would eventually come to light that while inside the consulate, Jamal Khashoggi had been intercepted by a group of Saudi hitmen. He was then slaughtered, dismembered, and removed from the building piece by piece by the men who had ended his life. Initially, the Saudi regime denied any involvement in Jamal's disappearance, and said that he had left the building alive and well. But after mounting political pressure, they eventually conceded that Jamal was dead. It's strongly suspected that his demise had been ordered by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, though he of course denies any involvement. What we do know for certain though, is that Saud al Qatani, aka Nokia 212, was the ringleader and mastermind behind the hit. Phone records show that he and the Crown Prince had been in contact in the hours before and after Jamal's life was taken. According to Reuters, Saud had even called into the consulate via Skype while Jamal was still alive and being held captive. During the video call, he reportedly taunted Jamal before telling his hit squad to bring me the head of the dog. To this day, Jamal's remains have never been located, and under the protection of the Crown Prince, Saud al Qatani has never faced legal repercussions for his role in the operation. It would later be revealed that shortly before Jamal's slaying, Saud had procured the tools used to hack into the phone of Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon and the owner of the Washington Post, the publication that Jamal worked for. His aim was to, quote, influence, if not silence, any negative reports related to the Saudi regime. This may have been how Saud knew that Jamal would be entering the consulate on October 2nd. It came as a shock to many users on Hack Forum that the kind and charitable Nokia 212 was actually a monster, and worse than that, many of them had unwittingly done jobs for him that may have caused some good people a lot of anguish. It just goes to show, when it comes to anonymous platforms on the internet, 
you never truly know who you're dealing with. While searching for new content to cover, I came across something on Reddit which caught my eye. Four months ago, user MadBull405 made a post on the Internet Mystery subreddit, titled Very Odd Text-to-Speech Generator That Seems to Have a Mind of Its Own. In the post, MadBull explained how he had been searching for a bonsai buddy clone to relive some childhood memories. While doing so, he stumbled upon tetties.com forward slash SAPI4. The only thing on the website is a basic text-to-speech generator with several synthetic voices to choose from. Outwardly, there's nothing weird about it, other than the fact that the phrase sui 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 is already in the text box when you enter the site. Weirder than that, if you ask the site to say it, it doesn't do so in the typical Microsoft Sam voice like it does with any other phrase, but rather in this voice. So that's a little strange, but perhaps Sui 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 is just an inside joke between the site's creators. But if you play around with the generator long enough, you'll start to realise that something's not quite right. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Bat, and today I am going to read some errors. Let's get started. If you type something into the text box and press the Say It function, Microsoft Sam will simply repeat whatever you wrote. Okay, please begin. However, every so often, you'll get something like this. Andy, do you and Lua know any good lawyers? A 70-year-old man who will find you and suck your life out of you. There is one thing about me that I am very aware of and that is I hate giving up on anybody even when I am forced to. Excellent. Now remove the Jopa mask to allow the torso to be removed. Going back to Mabel's post, he said that, quote, The generator won't always say what you typed in, but instead seemingly something at random. I even tried directly questioning the website thinking it was a low-level AI program running in the background. I typed in something along the lines of, Your website is bizarre and seems pretty sketchy. Care to comment? It started talking about rappers and why I should subscribe to them. I then typed, Hello, what's your name? To which it started playing a 20-second loop, saying, Life is pain, over and over again. That was about the point I closed the window. I found a few videos from a few years back of people fooling around on the website and having similar results. In the comments, a few users said that the generator told them to kill themselves, or that they were watching them. Reading through the replies to Mapple's post, it seemed like most people who checked out the page got some sort of unusual and dark altered messages rather than the ones that they had typed in. What I found really disturbing though were the people saying that they got specific responses to the things they wrote. It also doesn't seem like any of these creepy phrases get repeated. That they're all unique, and in some instances, eerily personalised. There's obviously something off about this website. So, what could it be? A joke site, made up to try and scare a few unsuspecting people? An old ARG that's long since been forgotten? Some sort of creepy AI? or something more sinister. Well, as weird as this text-to-speech generator can be, after spending a lot of time with it, I don't think Tetis is anything more than a meme site. The generator's probably been programmed to occasionally repeat a phrase written by some other user, hence why there's so little repetition in the unexpected replies. That's just me speculating. Still, just because the whole thing is, in all likelihood, a dark joke, doesn't mean the site can't genuinely be a little perturbing at times. Go and play around with it yourself for five minutes, and see what you think. Let me know in the comments if you get any unsettling messages yourself. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. 
A huge thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. The Deck of Cards, Mrs. Avon Rankin, Brad Hammer 33, Zane, The Only Dorita, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, Philip Wester, Peter Logdrach, Natalie Escobedo, Monica Mendoza, Myra Lancaster, Leonardo Martinez, Larry Mattingly, Kawaii Evil, Infamous Sempapi, Grace Archie, Gina Valera, George Lopez, Expand Dong, Crawford K. McDonald, Connell Lothan, Colin Monsma, Chief Kochuake, Azriel Warakai, Asia Mina, Anya Yekaterina Faustov, Alex Greensall, Jesse Jug, Hamish K, Torpid Chair 1139, Nefes 1988, and Lydia Kumo. Thank you guys so much for your continued support, it really helps the channel out. Let me know what you thought of this episode, and if you'd like to see more videos like this one. Remember to smash that like button, or I'll smash you, and you'll be hearing from me again very soon. Until then, you all stay spooky, and remember, the best things happen in the dark.